If I were to tell you the most important message I would share of the six presentations this weekend, it might well be this one. I am praying that the next hour would be life-changing in your prayer ministry. I grew up in a Christian family. My parents um, both were from non-Christian homes. My father was family was involved in the occult, and so strange things happened in my father's house. When they were still young, I'm listening to the microphone come and go. When they were still young, young teenagers actually, friends together, they started to go, in, go into a small Baptist chapel in Bristol, England. And uh, when they were newly married with a little boy still in their teens, pregnant with their second child, someone put a prophecy card under grandmother's door. That voice of prophecy card would change the trajectory of their lives. I was in utero at the time. I can say that I grew up in a family that had surrendered hearts to God, but nobody taught me how to pray. I had a few prayers that I learned. One was, thank you for the world so sweet, and thank you for the food we eat. Thank you for the birds that sing. Thank you, God, for everything. We used to sing it. I prayed that prayer so many times. I remember one time saying, thank you for the world so sweet, and thank you for the birds we eat. And I was a vegetarian. But that was one of the little prayers I learned. Another prayer that I learned was, Now I lay me down to sleep. Now I, you know that one too. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. Now, so far it's a fairly nice prayer. I don't know who wrote the second half of the prayer that terrorizes small children. But it says, if I die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. Have a good night, Derek. <laughs> uh, but those were a couple of the little prayers that I learned. Um, but nobody, and this is not an indictment, nobody taught me how to pray. I did hear that Christians typically when they prayed it would go blah, 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 in Jesus' name. Amen. Sometimes people would say, for Christ's sake. I had no idea what that meant. But in order to be part of that Christian community, when I would say, you know, help me to have a nice day and uh, help me not to do stupid things, in Jesus' name, I would say, in Jesus' name. But nobody ever taught me what that meant. It would take a young, a young Orthodox Muslim who became a follower of Jesus to teach me how to pray. By the way, I'd been a pastor, Mark, for many years. But it would take an Orthodox Muslim who had found Jesus to teach me how to pray. Yasmin grew up in, a, in an Orthodox Muslim family in Kolkata, India. She, as a young girl, was taught her Arabic prayers. They did not pray in their native tongue of Bengali, but in Arabic they prayed 
prayers five times a day. She was told, you don't have to understand what you're saying. You just have to say these prayers five times a day. When she was eight years old, her family hired a teacher to read through the Quran with her. All children were expected to read through the Quran starting at age eight. As she was reading through, by the way, her teacher had memorized the entire Quran. I think we should hide God's word in our hearts. What do you think? But she would stop and she would raise her hand and say, what does that mean? And the teacher would say, you don't have to understand what it means. You just have to read through the Quran. Well, you can sense that there's something missing in this young lady's heart. Can you sense that? She was 16 years old, break in her high school studies, when she, with a group of friends, was walking down Park Street in Kolkata. I've walked down that road. In fact, I've been to the red brick building, where as she and her friends were walking by, they saw a sign that said, Revival. They had no idea what the word revival meant. But underneath it said, free lunch. <laughs> and so they thought, well, we could, save our, we could save our lunch money and watch a movie this afternoon. So they went in, and the teacher was sharing from the Bible. Now, he even shared some about prophecies from the Bible, and she believed in the prophets, so of course they weren't the last and the greatest prophet, but he showed how prophecies in the Bible were fulfilled in every detail, and, and Yasmin became interested. After the free lunch, her friend said, let's go shopping again, but Yasmin said, no, I think I'll stay and listen to the teacher. There were about a hundred people there at the red brick building on Park Street. The teacher even spoke about Jesus. Now, Yasmin believed that Jesus was a prophet, but not the last and the greatest prophet, and certainly not the Son of God. But she enjoyed her day. She even took notes. And as she was leaving at the end of the day, walking out of the lobby of that red brick building, someone reached out a hand and said, Thanks for coming. See you tomorrow. She said, tomorrow? I thought it was today. Oh, no, they said, it's all week. It's all week. Well, Yasmin went home, got up the next morning. Her friends got in touch with her. There was a break from school. Shall we go shopping again? She said, no, I think I'm going to go back to, to, to that revival meeting. Ah, oh, they said, you just want more free food. But that's not what she was hungering for. Didn't Jesus say, blessed is the one who hungers and thirsts after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Hallelujah. She goes back. She goes every day. She takes careful notes. I learned later that they followed up with another seminar. I met the teacher who taught that class, by the way. He's now a vice president of the Southern Asia Division. I met him, man of God. A, a follow up Daniel seminar. They had a test to see if people were paying attention. Would you like to guess who got the highest score on the test? The young Muslim girl, Yasmin. And they gave her a present. Have you ever been given a useless present? They're normally made of plexiglass or... Do you know what I'm talking about? I'm so thankful that they didn't give Yasmin like a plaque, highest score. Would you like to guess what they gave her? They gave her a little red Bible. She still has it today. She took that little red Bible home with her. 
I'm sure, I'm sure she wanted to show it to her Orthodox Muslim parents, but she knew it was not the right time. But she took this little red Bible and she began to read. And she read something that changed everything. It was the word of Jesus recorded in John chapter 14. And there, and I put it in red letters on the screen because it's red letter edition. Oh, it went to a different color when they changed the format. I have it in red letters in my Bible. And whatever you ask in my name, Jesus said, that I will do. Now, I think I'd heard that. Has anyone ever heard that before? But I never paid attention to the second half of the verse. That's always very dangerous to not pay attention. You see, Jesus said, if you ask anything in my name, that I will do, what? That the Father may be glorified in the Son. Listen to me carefully. We're going to talk about praying in the name of Jesus, but it's not so much related to getting answers to your prayer. It's that the Father may be glorified in the Son. That's what it's about. And if there are men and women of God who say, I will have the courage, as I learn what it means to pray in the name of Jesus, to actually do that, it's about the Father being glorified in the Son. Sometimes people just read verse 14. I think that's unfortunate. But it says, if you ask anything in my name. But we know that we will misunderstand that verse unless we have read the previous verse. That the Father may be glorified in. It's all about Jesus. She read those verses. And she said... I am going to put Jesus to the test. 16 years old, Orthodox Muslim. (laughs) I am going to put Jesus to the test. I imagine the angels in heaven using my favorite Hebrew words. Hallelujah. You see, Jesus will stand the test. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it, help me now, that the Father may be glorified in. It's all about Jesus. And the testimony that she shared with me startled me. I have never recovered. Praise God. In fact, her testimony Drove me back to the scripture, Cheryl. You see, did I tell you nobody ever explained to me what it meant to pray in the name of Jesus? We just said, in Jesus' name. It drove me back to the scriptures. Her testimony shocked me. And I asked myself the question, what does it mean to pray? In the name of Jesus. Now, it's possible that the majority of you here say, Pastor Derek, uh, we heard that at prayer conference last year. We already know. But I am certain there are some people here who are just like I was, that we just prayed in Jesus' name, but nobody told us what it meant. So I began to study in my Bible, and I, I, I first discovered what it does not mean. Follow with me. I discovered what it does not mean. To pray in the name of Jesus does not mean to use his name like a magic charm without any living connection with him. Let me give you an illustration. Acts chapter 19, if you have your Bible, I'm going to share the story. Acts chapter 19, seven sons of a chief priest Jewish chief priest, hear about people casting out demons in the name of Jesus. 
these people would say, we cast you out by Jesus whom Paul preaches. Well, these seven sons, verse 14 of Acts 19, heard about that. And so they tried to cast out a demon. Verse 15, the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus, I know. And Paul, I know. Who are you? Verse 16 of Acts 19, the man in whom the evil spirit was leapt on them, overpowered them, and prevailed against them. How many were there? Seven. Prevailed against them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. Those seven brothers learned an important lesson. You don't have to learn it that way. They learned that you cannot use the name of Jesus like a lucky charm, like a magic mantra, Jesus, Jesus. Whatever it means to pray in the name of Jesus it does not mean that you use his name like a lucky charm with no living connection with him. Are you with me so far? By the way, people still do that today. No living connection. I kept studying in my Bible, and I discovered some things that it does mean. Now, you may come up to me after this meeting and say, Pastor Derek, I want to suggest some other things that it means to pray in the name of Jesus, and I would be happy for you to be my teacher. But let me suggest two things that it means to pray in the name of Jesus. These are vitally important. First, to pray in the name of Jesus means that we take our stand under his what? We take our stand under his authority. Jesus, before he ascended to heaven, Matthew 28 and verse 18, Jesus says, all authority. How much authority? You know the demons tremble. <laughs> How much authority is given to Jesus? All authority. Where? In heaven and on earth. All authority. The next word in my Bible is the word go. If you have a King James, it may be therefore go. And that's a conjunction, I understand. But who has the authority? And what does he tell us to do? Question. How are we supposed to go? Are we supposed to go in our own authority? Do you want to fight against the kingdom of darkness in your own authority? If you do, you need to come to the evening presentation. Go. Standing under the authority of Jesus. And just as we go standing under his authority, so we must pray in his name, standing under his what? That's the only way you explain the story in Acts chapter 3. You know the song, Peter and James, John went to pray. They saw a lame man on the way. I bet, I bet... Uh, Emily and Abby could sing that. He held out his palms and he asked for some, that's care for the needy, for those of you that don't know Old English. And this is what Peter did say. Oh, that's New King James, sorry. You don't sound too good this morning. Let me read it. Silver and gold I do not have, but what I have I give you. Hear me now. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, 
rise up and walk. <laughs> and the Bible says he went walking and leaping and maybe we should relax a little. Walking and leaping and praising God. What had this lame man experience, he had experienced the power of praying, standing under the authority of Jesus. Jesus said, if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Help me now, that the Father may be glorified. You see, that lame man wasn't going, you know, those two Fishermen, Peter and John, they're awesome. Yeah, no way. This lame man, now healed, was saying, Jesus is awesome. Jesus is the Son of God, the Savior of the world. When we pray in the name of Jesus, we take our stand under his... Did you get that? Don't miss that. I was involved in a, an encounter with the demonic forces. We'll talk later tonight. The demon said, where shall I go? Where, what would you say if the demon said, where shall I go? Well, I said something foolish, like I was going to send him to the abyss. He just stayed. You know what I said? You will go where Jesus consigns you to go. Boom! He was gone. Standing under the authority of Jesus. If you forget anything else, that's enough. It's more than just, well, that's what Christians do. No, no, have a nice day. In Jesus' name, amen. No, no. I can't pray the same anymore. When we pray in the name of Jesus, we are taking our stand under his authority. <laughs> I kept studying in my Bible. I found something else. Nobody taught me, what does it mean to pray in the name of Jesus? And I discovered to pray in the name of Jesus also means that we are what? To his will. Is there a text that tells me that, or did I just make that up? Well, look in your Bible in 1 John, same gospel writer who wrote the words of Jesus that Yasmin read. In John 14, here in 1 John chapter 5, the Apostle John writes, I'll read it from my Bible, you can follow along. Now this is the confidence that we have in him, that's in Jesus. That if we ask, what does it say? Anything, how? He hears us. You see, to pray in the name of Jesus is not just a jingle at the end of a Christian prayer. To pray in the name of Jesus is certainly not using his name like a magic charm. To pray in the name of Jesus means that we take our stand under his authority, surrendered to his... Can you remember that? You say, Pastor Derek, I already knew that. Praise God. Nobody taught me. Yasmin said, I'm going to put Jesus to the test. Is that okay? Well, don't play games with Jesus. But if your heart's sincere, he can stand the test. Do I have a witness out there? Can he stand the test? I mean, please, if he can't stand the test, what are we doing here? He has a name that is above every name. And at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is kurios, Lord, to the glory of God the Father. You see, it's all about that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Well, ja Yasmin said, I'm going to put him to the test. So this was her first prayer. Would you like to hear it? She said, uh, by the way, I, I met Yasmin in 2013. I met her again holding meetings in Zambia just a few months ago. She's still shining for Jesus. So I didn't tell you this, but when I first met her, 
She was walking down the hallway in, in Bloemfontein, South Africa. She was walking down the hallway, and her face was shining like the face of an angel. John, I'd never seen anything like it. It startled me. I wanted to go up to her and say, why is your face shining? But what flashed into my mind was Stephen the deacon. When it says they looked at him, Acts 6, verse 15, and they said his face was shining like the face of an angel. Here, she's sharing her story now with me, and I recorded it with my laptop computer because I don't like people sharing stories and saying, I think there were two angels, maybe three and one of the names was Rupert, I think, or maybe it was Raphael. I don't like that. I, I want to give you an accurate witness of a testimony that changed my life. Here's her first prayer. She wore these leather sandals. Now, none of you have them on today because it's cold. But do you have any of those sandals, ladies, that just have a little thing you hold your toe with, like a flip-flop? You know what they called it? You know what I'm talking about? Well, she would wear these, very common there in India. Uh, but she had trouble. The little strap would always break on her toe. And, and once that's broken, it's over, right? And so she thought, well, I have a problem with these sandals. I don't, I don't know if it was the way she walked. or I have a problem. My sandals break. So I'm going to pray. This is her first prayer. Lord... Please help my sandals not to break. In the name of Jesus, amen. You say, that's not a prayer. Well, let me ask you, is she playing a game with God? You know, I love Jesus. <laughs> he meets us right where he finds us. Lord, help my sandals not to break. In the name of Jesus, amen. She's sharing her testimony. Tears are running down her cheeks. She said, Derek, that was 15 years ago. My sandals have never broken since. Now, I know you're going to say, hallelujah, never have to buy any more shoes. No, we're not talking about that. Though, isn't there an account in the scripture when wandering through the wilderness, their shoes did? Come on now. Their shoes didn't wear out and their clothes didn't, right? There are times when God may intervene into what would otherwise be normal wear and tear. Now, of course, she didn't know the day she prayed and the next day that her sandals would not break for 15 years, right? But as the days pass, she wonders. Maybe there's more than I have been taught. Maybe Jesus is not just another prophet. Maybe he is the Son of God, Savior of the world. <laughs> and Jesus said, if you ask anything, he put her to the challenge. In my name, I will do it that the Father may be glorified in the Son. She said, I'm going to pray another prayer. You want to hear her next prayer? She was studying for a biology test. Now, we've got some experts in physiology here. We've got te teachers and, and physicians and nurse practitioners. and They were studying about meiosis and mitosis. Does anyone know what that is? You can explain it to me after the meeting. And she studied very hard. She was a good student. And she said, I'm going to pray another prayer. Lord, help the teacher to ask a question tomorrow that no one can answer. And then have the teacher ask me if I know the answer. In the name of Jesus. Amen. You say, that's a strange prayer. Especially because Jasmine was very quiet. In fact, she'd never been outside of the city of Kolkata. She was escorted to school and back every day. But somehow she prayed that prayer. 
got up the next morning, went to school, sitting in her biology class. The teacher asked a question, and the classroom was silent. Then the teacher came all the way down and looked directly at Yasmin and said, do you know the answer? Yes. <laughs> And Yasmin said yes, and gave a, a complete answer to the question. Well, the teacher was very impressed. Good student, Yasmin. By the way, she's an outstanding student, now teaching at an Adventist university, but that's a little later in the story. Do you think as she walked out of the class that day, she thought, I'm hot, they're not. That the Father may be in the Son. Yasmin walked out. <laughs> the name of Jesus. She kept going to that red brick building on Park Street. It's actually a Seventh-day Adventist church that had a revival meeting. She kept going week by week. Her parents, they didn't seem to object because she was doing so well in school. Did you know Jesus said, if you seek first the kingdom? Do I have a witness? <laughs> She's outstanding scholastic achievement. They think she must be getting tutoring on Saturday morning. <laughs> she was, for life and for eternity. Well, the day came that Yasmin decided that she wanted to be baptized as a confession of her faith in Jesus as her Savior. So she went to one of the elders at the church. She said, I would like to be baptized. Do you know what the elder said? Oh, no. You, you can't be baptized. You are a Muslim. <clears throat> Why, it could cause a lot of trouble. We say, oh, Derek. <laughs> but you know it's not the end of the story, right? So Yasmin doesn't give up. She goes to the pastor, the one who had the revival meeting. She says, and I met that pastor in San Antonio, Texas, the general conference session, Dr. Victor Sam. She said, Pastor, I would like to be baptized and confess myself a follower of Jesus as my Savior and Lord. And the pastor said, Yasmin, will you pray about it for one week? And I will pray. Give us more pastors like that. <laughs> Dear Lord, you pray for one week, Yasmin. I will pray for one week. And if after one week you are still absolutely committed to be baptized in the name of Jesus, confess yourself a follower of Jesus, I will baptize you. Amen. You're with me. Well, you know she came back a week later, and she said, Pastor, I'm ready. He prepared her. The day of her baptism, she wanted to invite her mother and father, but she knew it was not time. She's now almost 18. But when her father found out, whew, Would you like to guess what happened when her father, her Orthodox Muslim father, found out that she was baptized in the name of Jesus? He stormed into her room, grabbed a little red suitcase, threw a few clothes in it, brought the suitcase out, pushed it into her hand, and pointed to the door and said, There is no place for an infidel in my house. The mother tried to intervene. 
she's just young, a young girl. My decision is made, says the father. No place for an infidel in my house. And so Yasmin, still in her 17th year, almost 18, takes that little red suitcase, steps across the threshold of her front door, and the door closes behind her. What would you suggest that she do now? Pray? How should she pray? Come on now. How should she pray? Standing under his? <laughs> surrendered to his? She prays in the name of Jesus. And an immediate thought comes to her mind. Go to the church. She makes her way to Park Street. And the pastor is waiting for her. <laughs> you didn't hear what I said, did you? You see, I've been reading my Bible. And I know that when <coughs> Jesus appears to Saul on the Damascus Road, that he can also appear to someone else in Damascus. Get up, Ananias. I want you to go to the street called Straight, to the house of Judas. You see, there's a man there. I know you think he's a terrorist, but he's my chosen servant. You see, Jesus can transform people. So it should not surprise us that that the pastor would be waiting for her. Really? Is our God an awesome God? Yes. The pastor's waiting for her with a check for 25,000 rupees and a train ticket. To this day, Yasmin has no idea where that 25,000 rupees came from. It was handed to her by the pastor. I met the pastor in San Antonio. He told me where that 25,000 came from. God spoke. Oh, I can't tell you because Yasmin doesn't know. <laughs> Yasmin's giving her testimony to me. She's now 31 giving her testimony. So years have passed since she was almost 18. She said, for a young girl... Well, a young girl doesn't travel across India on a train alone. By the way, to travel from Kolkata to Pune on the west coast is 36 hours on the train. She said, you don't go by yourself. You could get kidnapped or assaulted. Or... But Yasmin gets on the train with her little red suitcase and she's not afraid. Why? Because she is not alone. Not because she knows Kung Fu or Taekwondo. It's not because she's carrying a firearm. She has taken her stand under the authority of Jesus. Surrendered to his will. She gets on the train and travels all the way across India, arriving at the Pune train station at 2 o'clock, or was it 3 o'clock? I'll give you a disclaimer on that one. I believe it was 3 o'clock in the morning. Early morning. Can I say that? That's accurate. Have you ever been to a train station at that time in the morning? Don't go. There are strange people there. It's not a place for a young girl to, let's go see what's happening at the train station at 3 in the morning. She gets off the train, passengers scurrying to their intended destination. She has no idea 
how she is to get, by the way, the pastor had told her, this is your school fees to go to Spicer, used to be called Spicer Memorial College, now Spicer University Memorial College back in those days. She has no idea what, where that is. She gets off the train. They tell me it's somewhere from 15 to 20 kilometers. I guess it depends which way you go. It's 3 o'clock in the morning. She's standing on the platform of the train station. What would you suggest she do now? How should she pray? In the name of Jesus. Standing under his and surrendered to his it's not just a little in Jesus' name, right? While she's standing there, a tall, slender man walks up to her and says to her, where are you going, my child? <laughs> she said... <laughs> I'm going to Spicer Memorial College. <laughs> he said, I will take you. He takes a little red suitcase. They go out of the train station. Has anyone here been to India? Some of you have been to Asia, different parts. Do you know what an auto rickshaw is? The old rickshaws were like a little bench seat and someone would hold it, and, right? But the auto rickshaw is like a scooter with a bench seat. Anyone been on one of those? You know what I'm talking about, right? If you, if you don't know, you can Google it later. Auto rickshaw. Comes out, there's an auto rickshaw. He puts the little red suitcase on the bench seat. He invites Yasmin to get on the seat. He gets onto the motorcycle, to the scooter, and drives out into the darkness. You say, that's insane. It's 3 o'clock in the morning. She has no idea who this is. And they're driving away from civilization out into the darkness. But Yasmin is not afraid. <laughs> you already know why, right? <laughs> because she has taken her stand under the... And she has surrendered to his... She has prayed in the name of Jesus... Do you see how I've never recovered from this testimony? This tall stranger drives her out through the darkness and arrives at the front gate of Spicer Memorial Hospital, uh, College, excuse me. She told me in her testimony there in Blomfontein, 13 years later, if he had dropped her off at the front gate, she would have had no idea where to go. Some of you have been to colleges and universities. Did they drop you off at 3 in the morning at the front gate? But this tall, slender man drove her all the way through the campus and dropped her off at the front door of the girls' dormitory. Here you are, my child. <laughs> now, while she was sharing that story with me, I was just wondering, was anybody here wondering about that tall stranger? I was just wondering, but I didn't have the courage to ask her. I'm just listening. Yasmin went back to that train station many times during her time at Spicer. She graduated with honors, outstanding student, took a graduate degree there. By the way, she now has a PhD. Many times when she would go back to that train station, she looked for that tall, slender man, and he was never there. He was just there that night. <laughs> Three o'clock in the morning, because somebody prayed in the name of Jesus. <laughs> I saw Yasmin just a few months ago. She's still shining. 
That's her doctoral grant gown, by the way. I saw Yasmin, and I, I just had to ask her. I said, Yasmin, what do you think about that tall stranger? <laughs> she said, I think he was an angel. But you know what I realized? It really didn't matter whether it was an angel from the courts of heaven or an angel from Pune, like Ananias, where the Lord came in the middle of the night and said, Get up! <laughs> Why, Lord? <laughs> You need to go to the train station because there at the train station, one of my daughters is praying in the name of Jesus. So maybe it doesn't matter, right? A messenger from heaven or a messenger from Pune who would listen to God. Yasmin is a devoted follower of Jesus. I have to share one last thing. I've got just a couple of minutes before our break. I wish I could share the whole story. Outside on the table is an iPad where you can log in. I'll show you during a break, and I will send you her full story, plus a whole collection of stories about people who were changed when they encountered Jesus, if you're interested, back there. In her third year, she gets a phone call. Yasmin was her mother. Your father is sick, and he wants to talk to you. Now, there's more to the story. I haven't time to share with you. She gets waiting, Papa. Fathers, Yasmin, will you pray for me? <laughs> Papa, I pray in the name of Jesus. She's been praying every day, too. <laughs> I pray in the name of Jesus. I know. And so this young, former Orthodox Muslim girl, she's now way over here in Pune, her father across the continent in Kolkata. She prays for him in the name of Jesus. And her father was healed. Don't miss 11 o'clock. I'm going to talk about prayer for healing. I know even when we pray, we stand under his authority, but also surrender to his. But you see, it's not about whether her father will live long or not. Praying for him in the name of Jesus is that the father may be glorified in the son. Nobody taught me that. Do you know today, Yasmin and her husband, Zambian husband, Fitzgerald, and their two beautiful children are welcome in her parents' home. Amen. And when they sit to pray at the meal, the father prays his Arabic prayer. And then he sits quietly and respectfully as his daughter prays in the name of Jesus. I know you're saying, did, did he become a Christian? My answer is, I haven't heard yet. But he's changed. Here's the one thought I would like you to remember as we go to break. Would you read it out loud with me? Can you see it? Let's read it together. When we pray in Jesus' name, standing under his authority and surrendered to his will, miracles happen. Maybe at our next prayer conference, 
will hear some of those, maybe even this weekend, maybe even tomorrow morning. But Jesus, this is what Jesus said, and whatever you ask in my name, that I will do. Why? That the Father, what? May be glorified in the Son. So I have a question as we close. Will you pray in the name of Jesus? Many of you may be prayer ministries leaders, leaders in your communities, churches, pastors. If you already knew this clear and crystal, crystal clear, it was a privilege to remind you that praying in the name of Jesus is a precious gift, not a Christian tradition, but a precious gift. And if you're hearing for the first time and say, Derek, I was just like you, nobody told me. I pray you would never forget and never pray the same again. Will you pray in the name of Jesus, standing under his authority and surrendered to his? Let's pray. I believe there are miracles that you would work even today. Tomorrow morning, I believe you brought people here to bless them in supernatural ways. And God, it is not about bringing attention to any person, but that the Father may be glorified in the Son. The glory and honor would go to the name of Jesus, who alone is worthy. And so we pray that you, by your Holy Spirit, would bless as we process these things. And as we pray, in the name of Jesus, may we do so with thankful hearts. Is our prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen.